Wow. Can you sense heaven? Can you sense destiny? Can you sense the king? I praise God. Praise the Lord. Outlines, Pastor. Who hasn't got an outline? Okay, if you'd like to leave your hand up and we'll get that to you. So this morning I want to uh, talk to you, just probably down a little bit on the foldbacks, I think. Thanks, Josh. I want to, I want to share with you just on the book of Daniel. <laughs> End times, I think it's uh, part four uh, that we're talking about. And uh, the book of Daniel is an amazing and incredible book on end times. Uh, and uh, I, I'm not going to be able to share everything that is in the book of Daniel because it's just absolutely huge. It's prophetic from beginning to end. Uh, in fact, it's just an amazing book, prophet, prof, um, you know, prophecies. If you read through it, men, if you want a good story over Christmas, if you want a kind of like a, an amazing story, I'd, I'd encourage you to read the book of Daniel. In fact, the sound is still feeling a little bit echoey, Josh. Um, okay, it's just probably on the fallbacks here. Daniel has, has, has angelic visitations. He begins, he's in, he's in Babylon, and we're going to have a look at that in just a moment. Um, but he has angelic visitations. Gabriel comes on in, one of the great archangels, and comes and visits him and speaks to him. Then you've got the archangel, the warring angel, Michael, who is actually the chief angel over Israel, who wars and, and fights for them. And you hear and you see God opening the doors and being able to let Daniel see the wars that are going on in heaven between spirit beings and the angelic beings. You've got visions of Nebuchadnezzar with the huge big golden statue that is declaring all of the kingdoms of the earth from his time in that Babylon all the way through to our day. And then you have um, Daniel. He has a vision of these four creatures, again, that aligns very much with Nebuchadnezzar's vision of all of these different kingdoms and empires that are taking place in Daniel's time, Babylon, Persia, all the way through to our day. And then talking about the end times, talking about Daniel's 70th week, and right on into the millennial reign. It's an absolute and amazing book um, that we see and, and, and are able to read. And uh, much of it, God has come and visited, and the angel Gabriel came and said, I have come to give you revelation and to give you understanding. And so it's a book where we can have revelation and we can have understanding. There's only one scripture where God says in, in, um, in Daniel chapter 12, lock up this vision. Uh, it's locked up. The revelation's locked up until the end times. And so we're in the end times right now, and so the whole of the book of Daniel can, is, is unlocked for us, and we can understand it. And again, it's probably, I would say, maybe four or five sessions that you would have to unlock and, and be able to explain it. So I'm just going to give some headlines, and we'll see how far we get uh, this morning. Praise God. You know, uh, one thing that, I, that we know about God is that our God is almighty. Yeah. And he declares the end from the beginning. And I want to open up with just this amazing scripture in uh, Isaiah 46, where God says that I am God and there's none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times things that are not yet done and saying, indeed, I have spoken it and I also will bring it to pass. I have purposed it and I also will do it. And so we are serving and we know and we part of a family where our God, he declares the end from the beginning and he will bring things to pass. Nothing is impossible to him. And so whatever we're seeing right now in the natural, in the, in the nations rising up and kingdoms and wars and rumors of wars and all of these kinds of things that are happening in this time, our God has no rival. He has no equal. There's none like him. And he's got this thing um, right now in his hands. Uh, we are the ones on the planet and on the earth right now that are making the choice who we're going to follow. There's two kingdoms out there. There's the kingdom of light, the kingdom of darkness. And accordingly, we are here as part of the, the outplaying and the outworking of these visions. We're choosing which path we're going to go on. We're choosing which kingdom we're going to serve. And accordingly, we're going to eat the fruit of whatever that is. And as for us in our household, Joshua said, we're going to serve the Lord. 
we're going to serve the Lord. And so I just even believe these end time messages, like I said to you uh, a couple of weeks ago, they have the they have the ability within them, the words that you read, to stir the fire of God that is inside you. There's a fire that got set inside you when you got born again, and the Holy Spirit came upon you, and you were set on fire from heaven. And that fire could be an ember. It could be just there, or it could be a full-on fire that's blazing for Jesus, and, and we've got that choice. And as for me, I want to be blazing for him when he comes to get me. I want to be so on fire for him, and I know that that's where you guys are as well. Praise the Lord. And so chap- Daniel, the cha- um, chapter 1, it's beginning with, the Babylo- um, it's be- beginning with Babylon, and it begins with the, um, uh, the Babylonians having moved into Israel and having conquered them. And uh, I'll just read some of the stuff here that the um, Babylon, when they would invade, uh, when they came in a huge, powerful empire, and and again, if if we have time, we'll look at the statue that Nebuchadnezzar, the king, had of this beautiful being that actually had a head of gold, and that had the silver, and it had the bronze, and it had the iron, and then the feet of iron and clay, and he had this vision, and it represented the empires that, um, that have, you know, been from his time onwards. In fact, if I back up here a little bit, it's amazing how some of the prophetic things that have been spoken in the book of Daniel, and it's, um, it's called eschatology, which is end time preaching. Some of it is so accurate that the book of Daniel has been accused of being written after the time and the fact, because it is so accurate that they don't believe that it was prophesied before. They believe it was actually written afterwards as a recording of what happened rather than God speaking those things that are not as if they are. Um, calling things by name. I mean, God called Cyrus by name hundreds of years before he was born as as, as the king of Medan, Persia. Incredible accuracy. Um, And so what happened in in Daniel 1 is that uh, Daniel um, was uh, a captive uh, in in Babylon. Babylon had come into Israel and they had um, conquered, they had decimated the country, they massacred people, Um, they'd taken a whole lot of the people away on a death march back to Babylon and many of them died on the way. They took some of the great young men um, that that they wanted to um, train in in the wisdom of of their their gods and um, have them as advisors, and a part of that was Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, and and Daniel. Um, And and these young men rose to incredible prominence over over the uh, Babylonian kingdom, and Daniel ended up being the advisor of four of those kings, uh, two of the kings, uh, was it two of the kings of of Babylon and then of the Medes and Persians. He was their chief advisor. He was over 120 wise men, and so he was a very busy man. And yet if you have a look at the book of Daniel, he found time to pray to God three times a day. And would not bow to the gods that he'd learned about. Um, he refused to, which caused him to go into the lion's den. Uh, he, uh, the, the young men refused to bow to, to the kings. And so they were thrown into the fiery furnace. And the fourth man in the fiery furnace was Jesus Christ uh, incarnate. And so it's some amazing stuff that we see here. And so at the beginning here, I was, sort of was, as I was preparing this and I was looking at, God, we need to have a backdrop of why were they in captivity? Why was Israel, God's people, that are called by his name, why had they gone into captivity? And so we have a look here that, um, you know, um, in fact, let me have a look. We read, in fact, I've got to, let me just read it here. When we read Israel's history, whether it is a period of the judges, whether it's the period of the kings or the prophets, Israel's history is a, a history of conquest, invasion, suffering, and war. If you have a look at it. This invading army came in. It was just the whole of this, this nation's just had trouble after trouble. Well, what is that? And why is that? I mean, did God not be faithful to his covenant? Why were they now in Babylon? Why was this king, who was nobody in God's eyes, why were they now able to, to um, destroy um, the, the children of Israel? Well, we find the answer to that in the book of uh, Deuteronomy, chapter 28, and Deuteronomy 30, where God had got Moses to reinstate the covenant that God had made with Israel. 
The first generation that were led out of Egypt and into the promised land, remember they were disobedient and they grumbled and they complained and they died in the wilderness. And so now the next generation is ready to go into the promised land and God gets Moses to restate the covenant. And so that's what Deuteronomy means. It means a second review of a covenant. And so God put out before them in Deuteronomy 28 where God said, and I believe it's in your outline, here, God spoke to them and it said, and it shall come to pass, this is, that this is God speaking a covenant to his people, that he is going to make an agreement with them. And he said, it's going to come to pass if you diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord your God and are careful to obey all of his commandments. God said that he's going to set you high above all the nations of the earth. That was God's dream. I want to set you high above all the nations of the earth. And God says, and all of these blessings are going to come upon you and are going to overtake you. And then we see from Deuteronomy 28, we read 2 to 14, we see all the blessings that, came, that God had planned to bring upon the children of Israel. Blessed in the city, blessed in the field, blessed coming in, blessed going out. The fruit of the, your womb is blessed, your basket is blessed, your storehouse is blessed. All of this was wealth and prosperity. I'm going to send rain for you. And God is going to give you abundance. One other thing, that if they would obey the commands of the Lord, God said here in Deuteronomy um, 28, uh, 7, it says, And the Lord will cause your enemies who rise up against you to be defeated before your face. They shall come against you one way, but, be, um, what is it, but flee before you seven ways. Well, now why is Israel in Babylon? If this is what the covenant said, that I will cause any enemy that comes against you to be defeated before your face. This was the covenant that God had made with Israel. And yet we see here that after the first part of that covenant, where God speaks about the blessing, you read the next part of Deuteronomy 28, which says, Now if you don't obey the Lord your God and keep his word and keep his commandment, all of this curse is going to come upon you. You're not going to have rain. You're not going to have crops. You're going to be decimated. Armies are going to come in you. They're going to take, take you away. They're going to destroy your cities, destroy your children, destroy your wives. You have a read of all of the destruction that would happen if they didn't, um, if they didn't fulfill their part of the covenant. And so we find here that in Deuteronomy 28, God declares the blessing. And God says, there's the curse. And God says, I put before you life and death. Deuteronomy 30. I put before you blessing and cursing. Now choose. And then he goes and tells them what to choose. Choose life that, that you and your children may live. And so what we find here, within that covenant, God also knew that the children of Israel, pre-adventure that they would disobey God, that part of Deuteronomy 28, God said to them, now if you do disobey me, and if you walk away from me, and you do go into captivity, and then you come to your senses and you think, oh my goodness me, we haven't obeyed the Lord like we should. God says, when you turn back to me, and if you will seek my face and turn from your wicked ways, that I am going to hear from heaven and I will heal your land. And so God said that on behalf of Solomon, when Solomon took over the kingdom, God reinstated, if you turn away from me, but you turn back, I'm going to hear from heaven, heal your land, if you'll humble yourself. Deuteronomy 38 says the same thing. And so there was a response here that Israel was in captivity for 70 years. Why? Because they had gone away from the Lord. Right from the time of King David, which was the pinnacle of Israel's history, after he died, Israel went on a slope downwards. And there was 490 years from the time of David's death until they went into captivity to Babylon. 490 years. Now, if we have a look at this, 490 years, what had happened in that 490 years is they had gone into idolatry, they'd gone into, uh, into fornication. You can read some of the stuff in Jeremiah of what Israel was into. God sent prophets to them to tell them to turn around. Isaiah was more positive, and he would say, come and turn around, and he will heal you, and he will bless you. Whereas Jeremiah, he just spelled it out how it was, and he was called the weeping prophet. Um, and he was telling them that they were in fornication, there was orgies going on, and they were offering their children in the fire, and burn sacrifices, it was their children that they were offering to the gods. And this was happening, and God was sending prophets to say, turn around. 
and serve the Lord until finally God said, no, enough is enough. And part of that 490 years is they had not let the land rest. God has set a principle in, in the beginning that God created the earth in six days, the seventh day he rested. He set a principle of a Sabbath rest. And God said to Israel, I'm giving you seven years. Every seventh year, you let the land rest. And then from seven sevens of 49, you have a sabbatical year or you have a year of jubilee where all debts were canceled, all slaves were free, and that's how they were supposed to operate in their nation. They didn't do that. They didn't want the land to rest. They thought, no, we're going to walk, work and we're going to continue to be more prosperous. And so God said at the end of a 490-year period, you owe me, you owe me Sabbaths, you owe me 70 years of Sabbath, and so I'm right now going to allow the king of Babylon to come into your nation, he's going to decimate this nation, he's going to destroy Jerusalem, and Jerusalem is going to be left vacant in a wilderness for 70 years, and then after 70 years are up, I'm going to allow you to come back. The land will have its rest. And so that's kind of the backdrop of why we are where we are and where Daniel is in this book. And so Daniel's reading the book, and if we have a look here, um, let's have a look. Daniel chapter 9. Uh, if, if we, um, sorry, Daniel chapter 9, verse 1 to 2. Let's have a look here. This is Daniel's reading, and it says here, In the first year of Darius... Now, we'd already had King Nebuchadnezzar, who was the king of Babylon, and King Nebuchadnezzar, his um, grandson took over, who was Belshazzar, who was a wicked, wicked king, um, who um, took the gold from God, the temple of God and started to um, drink from it at his parties. And remember the writing on the wall? Uh, and God said, your kingdom this day has been taken from you. And the king was just so corrupt, he just laughed at them. Um, but as the writing was going on the wall, the Medes and Persians had come under the wall, they'd stopped the water, and the army had come. Under the, under the channels, under the city, and had filled the streets as they were having a party and, and killed him, decimated him, and uh, their Medes, um, Medes and Persians took over. And so Darius was assigned to be uh, the ruling king over this area at the time. And so it says here, in the first year of Darius, the son of Azarias, of the lineage of the Medes, who was made king over the realm of the Sheldians, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood... By the books, the number of years specified by the word of the Lord through Jeremiah the prophet, and that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolation of Jerusalem. And so Daniel's saying here, he's reading this book, and he says, I understand why we are here. Because Jeremiah the prophet had been speaking to us and telling us to repent and to turn around, and we hadn't listened to him. And some of the scriptures, if you actually read in, in, in 2 Chronicles, where the prophets were coming and the people were just laughing at them and just mocking them and laughing at them. Um, and so he understood why he was here. And so what was the response of, of, of Daniel when he saw where they were at? He actually went back to the book of Deuteronomy where God says, when you see that you've sinned against me and you will humble yourself and, and confess your sin before me and repent, I'm going to heal your land. And so this is exactly what Daniel decided to do. He was going to do it according to covenant. And so this is his, this is his prayer to God in Daniel chapter 9, verse 3 to 15, and we'll only read some of it. But it's absolutely an amazing prayer. I felt like reading the whole lot because it's quite heart-wrenching um, to, to read. But he says there, when he realized where he was and where they were at because of their own sin, it says here, and then I set my face towards the Lord to make request um, by prayer and supplication with fasting, sackcloth and ashes. And I prayed to the Lord my God and made, um, and made confession and said, O Lord, great and awesome God, who keeps his covenant and mercy with those who love him and with those who keep his commands. We have sinned and committed iniquity. We have done wickedly and rebelled even by departing from your precepts and your judgments. 
Now, I wish I could actually carry on here. I haven't got my Bible with me. I think I left it up, upstairs, didn't I? He goes on to just say, if you just go home and just read the whole thing here, he just repents for us not listening to your prophets, us not keeping your laws, us not doing all of these things. And so he began to confess their, their sin before God. And it's interesting how Daniel was not a part of those people who had actually committed that sin. He was a godly man. He was seeking the Lord three times a day. He would not bow to the gods of, of, of the Medo Persians or the gods of Babylon. He refused to. And yet he is saying, We have done this. We have wronged you. And so he took ownership of that. And that's where we're, we're, it's, it's an amazing intercession that when we make intercession for our nation, when we make intercession for our family, that we can actually take that ownership of it and allow that in our heart. God, we have not served you as we should. Not they, 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 but we. And take that on board. You see, people don't, nowadays, people don't, don't want us to speak about sin and speak about these things, but how can we be cleansed? And how can our conscience be set free unless we give that back to God? And so he identifies himself with his people and takes on that personally. And it's interesting if you carry on having a look here in Daniel uh, chapter 9, verse 20, here's God's response. After my people who are called by my name have humbled themselves and prayed, have seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, that I will hear from heaven and I will begin and I'll heal their land. And so here's the response here from God to Daniel's prayer. He sends the angel Gabriel to him. And it says here, Now while I was speaking and praying and confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel and presenting my supplication before the Lord my God from the holy mountain of my God, while I was speaking in prayer, the man Gabriel, who, whom I'd seen in a vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, reached me about the time of the evening offering. And he informed me, and he talked to me, and he said, O oh Daniel, I have now come forth to give you skill and, un and, and to understand. And, to, and at the beginning of your supplications, the command went out, and I have come to tell you, for you are greatly beloved. Therefore, consider the matter and understand the vision. And so Daniel's right now, he's read the book of Jeremiah. He realizes the 70 years of captivity is up that they now are to be released. They weren't released until they came and made supplication before God and asked God to forgive them for their sin. And now they're in a place where, where Gabriel says, as soon as you began supplication, the answer was released from heaven. Now that's interesting, isn't it? As soon as you have made supplication, made a confession before the Lord, there is an answer that's released from heaven. And he says, now... God is going to give you understanding of what is going to take place from here onwards. Now, Daniel was only asking what was going to be taking place now. But it's interesting how God gave him the now as well as all of the kingdoms of the earth right up until the end time and unto um, God's, us or Jesus Christ's second coming. And it's interesting when you look at prophetic scripture, um, God, God brings things together. Oftentimes people can be confused when they read scripture, but God clumps things together like unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. That's the first coming of Jesus Christ. And the government shall be upon his shoulders. That's the second coming. God clumps things together. Oh, thank you. <laughs> God brings things together um, and... and and people that are reading that or haven't had understanding in the Old Testament, they see things as being one complete picture rather than God splicing and segmenting things up. And so as we have a look at this here, you're going to find that God is slicing things up into different chunks of time period, if that makes sense. So Daniel 24, 9, 24 to 27, he says here, 70 weeks, Daniel's asking what's going to happen? After this time, God says, 70 weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city to finish the transgression and to and make an end of sin, to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up the vision of prophecy and to anoint the Holy One. 
Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah Prince, there shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks. The streets shall be built again, the walls even in troublesome times. Then it goes on to say, um, so part of this is looking, looking like, goodness me, this is, there's a lot of stuff here. What's going on? Let me just read the first part here. 70 weeks is determined for your people. 70 weeks, who's God talking about? 70 weeks is determined for your people. Is he talking to the church? Is he talking to the nations? He's talking to Israel. He's talking to Daniel. He's talking to Israel. So God's talking about Israel. And for your holy city, God is talking to Jerusalem, about Jerusalem. So 70 weeks is determined. So what does that weeks mean? Does that mean one seven-day period? What is God talking about here? And I've got it in your outline that there are different ways of dividing time. Uh, it can be by, divided into tens. If you have 10 years, what do you get? A decade. And if you have 10 decades, what do you get? A century. And you have 10 centuries, you get a millennium. And so that's one way of counting time. Um, God in his clock, he counts times by seven. Seven days. Seven years. Seven sevens are 49. There's your jubilee year. And so when God counts things, he counts it according to, 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 to sevens. And at the end of the, uh, the, the sixth year on the seventh, there's a jubilee, there's a rest there um, that God counts as important. And that's why we have seven days and then we have a, a six days and then we have the Sabbath rest. That's an eternal principle that's going to be on in the millennium and it's going to go on into eternity. And so for us to think uh, even now, well, hey, look, that's under the law. It doesn't apply. No, it was before the law. The law was written in Moses. And so before Moses' time, when God created the earth, he himself rested on the seventh day. And the earth is now waiting for the rest, which is the millennial reign of Jesus Christ, where he will reign and he will rule on the earth for a thousand years and the land and the earth will have its rest. Praise the Lord. And so here, so there's different time periods. And so the interpretation of the scripture here, which many people say is the hub of prophetic uh, insight for Israel. So 70 weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city to finish the transgression. So let's have a look there. The six things that the scripture, this scripture, uh, verse 24 tells us. God says the six things are to finish the transgression. The next one is to make an end of sin and then to make reconciliation for iniquity. Number four is to bring in everlasting righteousness to seal up the vision of prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. Now, prophetically, we can say that there is two groups within the six points. Three have already taken place at the, first, at the first coming of Jesus Christ, and three are yet to come. If we have a look at this, the first advent, and it should be on your outline, to finish the transgression. What did Jesus Christ come to do? He came to make a payment for our transgression. What does it say here? To put away sin. Why did he die on the cross and go to hell? To put away sin. Then he goes here, to make reconciliation for iniquity. What did, he, what did Jesus Christ do? He came and he made reconciliation. He reconciled the world unto himself for all those who will choose it. Isn't that amazing? And just that part of that scripture. Jesus Christ came to make the payment for transgression. He came to put away sin. And now the world has been brought back and now is reconciled back to God. They just need to say yes. Praise God. And so all of that happened at the first coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, when he came as the Lamb of God to be slain. He's coming again as the lion of the tribe of Judah. And when he comes the second time at the second advent, this is what's going to happen. To bring in everlasting righteousness. This is where Jesus Christ, he's going to come in at, on, at the millennial reign and he's going to bring righteousness into the earth. Seal up the vision and prophecy. Jesus Christ is going to fulfill all prophecy. To anoint the most holy, which is reference to Messiah, who is going to be anointed. He was anointed when he came as the Lamb with the Holy Spirit. He was anointed to do those works, but he did not come and he did not rule as King of Kings and Lord of Lords at that time. He came as the Lamb to be slain, but this time when he comes, he's going to be anointed as the most holy. 
and he's going to rule as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. There will be no equal. There will be no rival. He will rule and reign. And so within this one verse, you've got the whole story of God's salvation for the earth. Isn't that amazing? Absolutely amazing. And again, theologians, someone that you could read after is Bob Yangin on End Times. Amazing. Another gentleman that you can read after, if you would like to, um, is called uh, Dwight Pentecost. An amazing theologian who, um, who I've, I've read after. Um, both of these guys I feel are really solid. You read after a whole lot of other stuff in Google, and you're going to get all kinds of doctrine out there. But these two men are solid. Um, um, Dwight Pentecost, he was preaching at the Dallas um, Seminary Bible College until he was 99 years old. And three months after he stepped down, he went on into heaven. Isn't that amazing? You can get online and listen to this gentleman of gentlemen, an absolute amazing theologian, very balanced uh, man, uh, and served the Lord all his life. And so again, this, this doctrine here comes from some of these seasoned men of God who've walked with God and, 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 and are able to unfold Scripture. So here we go here. Let's have a look. It says here, in, verse, uh, in, in Daniel 25, let's just read it again. 70 weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city. And so we've seen that the 70 weeks has been determined for them. And then it goes on to say, verse 25, Know therefore and understand, Daniel, that from the going forth of the command to restore and rebuild Jerusalem, he said there is going to be 62 weeks. And then after that 62 weeks, Messiah will come, shall come. If you just jump down there, he shall be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince who is yet to come shall destroy the city and sanctuary. The end of, the, of it shall be with flood until the end of war desolations are determined. And so let's just have a look at that here. It says here, know therefore and understand so if God says, if the angel says, if Gabriel says to, to, to Daniel, know and understand. You can know this and you can understand this. That from the going forth of the command to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. Now keep in mind that Jerusalem had been decimated. The Babylonian Empire had just decimated it. It was left desolate. And so now they're waiting for a king because they're under captivity, to send forth the commands. And so we've put here the different commands, King Cyrus... He says, no, therefore, from the going forth of the command to rebuild Jerusalem. In fact, let me just grab this in Daniel. One second. So I get the whole thing. Daniel 9, 25. Know, therefore, and understand that from the going forth of the command... Uh, to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks. So there'll be seven weeks and 62 weeks. The streets uh, shall be built again and the wall, even in troublesome times. And so let's have a look at that right there. In, in 2 Chronicles, Cyrus, do you remember if you read in 2 Chronicles, you Bible college students, you would have read that King Cyrus sent out a decree. And the decree that he, that he sent forth was to build the temple. It wasn't to be, rebuild the streets, it was to rebuild the temple. So that, that decree you've got there was in 53 AD. So that can't, be the, that can't be the prophecy, or that can't be the timeline that we're looking at. Then you had Darius who came in, and in Ezra, he sent a second decree to rebuild the temple. And so if you're being very specific, those two decrees were to do with the temple. Then we have a Nehemiah. Do you remember Nehemiah? He was the cupbearer, and he was looking depressed, and some news had come back to him from his, from his family and saying, Jerusalem is broken down. Yeah, the temple's being rebuilt, but Jerusalem is an absolute mess. And he again humbled himself and started to cry out to God. He confessed his sin and the sin of his people for not following God and that the, the city had been left desolate. And then God immediately answered him. And here we find Artaxerxes, 
when he was serving Artaxerxes, Artaxerxes said, what's wrong with you, Nehemiah? He said, you're all depressed today. And he got fearful because you weren't allowed to be depressed in front of the emperor. You could lose your head. And he says, oh, emperor, he said, if you knew, he said, my heart is grieved because my city is des- desolate. And so Artaxerxes said, oh, goodness me. He said, look, I want to finance the whole rebuild of your, of your, of your nation. And so Nehemiah went back. He said, and he just said look, I can't be your cupbearer anymore. He says, because this is going to take time. And so we find here that Nehemiah went back. The king had financed the whole rebuild of the walls of Jerusalem. And we find here that in that scripture, which it says here, after 62 weeks, it says, oh, where are we? I've actually left some of the scripture out, I think. Know therefore and understand from the going forth of the command to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there will be seven weeks and 62 weeks. Now the seven weeks, as we said, I mean, God's working in, 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 in units of seven. And so seven years. Remember, Daniel said it was 70 years that we were in, in, in Babylon. And so we could say here, if you do your maths here, that it shall be seven weeks. So what would be seven weeks? So that's seven years. So seven sevens are 49. So in 49 years, history tells us that when Nehemiah went back, that the city was rebuilt. That city during that time was rebuilt. Have a look in history. Go through there and have a look. And so God says to, it says to Daniel that the streets, it says here that there shall be seven weeks, which is 49 years, and then 62 weeks. So in seven weeks, Israel, the nation of Israel, was rebuilt. And it started, and it was built in troublesome times because they were still in, they, they still had armies that were happening there. So we actually have a starting point when the command went from King Artaxerxes, when he commanded them to go back and rebuild, we actually have a starting point for this period of time called the um, what is it, 62 weeks. So 62 times, I should actually have a whiteboard here. What is 62 weeks, guys? <laughs> I'll write it down here. 62 weeks times seven. Seven twos are 14. Six sevens are 42, 43. So 434 years. 434 years, he said, from the time the command goes forth to rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah Prince appears, until the Messiah appears, is going to be 434 years. Jesus Christ appeared 434 years after Jerusalem was rebuilt at the command of Artaxerxes. Now that's pretty amazing. And then it goes on to say, after that time, it says here, after those years, no, he said then, that the streets shall be built in troublesome time. It says then after the 62 weeks, so after that 434 years, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. So what is that? That means that Jesus Christ came 434 years after the command and the Messiah would be cut off. What does cut off mean? He was actually crucified. For himself? No, not for himself. But for the sins of the people. Now this is exact. God is, God is very exact with his times and his years and his dates. And this is why when Messiah turned up, the wise men knew his star was in the east. When Messiah came in to, to, to Israel and the people understood um, that, hey, he was Messiah. And that's why they were saying in the streets, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. That was taken from Psalm 118, which was the grand entry of Messiah coming at the second coming. Now, they didn't realize that there was a gap between Messiah coming as the Lamb and Messiah coming as the King of Kings. And that gap was the period of 2,000 years, which is the church age, the dispensation of grace. And so this is where um, the people of his time, when they were saying, crucify him, he's not the Messiah. He's a false Messiah. We thought he was coming to set up his kingdom. We thought that he was coming to deliver us from the Roman Empire. And so after 62 weeks, Messiah will be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince who is yet to come will destroy the city. Well, we looked at that the last time. The people of the prince who is yet to come. It's not the prince, but the people of the prince. Who were ruling in Israel at that time that Jesus was crucified? It was the Roman Empire. 
The Roman Empire was ruling on the earth at the time Messiah was cut off. And it says here that these people, what are they going to do? They're going to destroy the city again. And we find the Romans, after Jesus was crucified, in AD 70, came in and absolutely decimated uh, the, the nation of Israel. They decimated Jerusalem. And then God said, remember in the scripture, it says Jesus actually spoke it. And he said in Matthew 24, and Jerusalem will be trodden down by the Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles is fulfilled. And so we see for a period of nearly 2,000 years, Jerusalem has been trodden down by the Gentiles. It's been a decimation. Um, in fact, um, Dwight um, Pentecost, he says that there's been at least 68 invasions since that time. That, nation, that, that, that city has been so decimated over, thousand, over these 2,000 years. It's just like no, no other city on earth. And that's what God said. God said it, there's a, the end will be with a flood. It says here, until the end, wars are going to be on that city. Desolations are determined for that city until the time of the end. And then all of a sudden we find here that God says when his people come back 1948 Israel was restated as a nation she then having been scattered for the four corners of the world and prophecy has spoken that that God would put them into all corners of the earth and then God would call them back again you know, Jeremiah said the same thing, you know, when he was prophesying about Israel. And, he, and Jeremiah, he, they used to wear a prophet's cloak. And Jeremiah was talking about their decimation. And some of it was at that time, some of it was end times. And he took off his, he took off his, off his robe and he prophesied naked through, through, through the nation at the time. Now, he wasn't naked. He had a loincloth. He just took off his prophetic ministry cloth and he buried it. Uh, and one day God is going to unbury, unbury his treasure. Remember God said that Jesus talked about a parable of the pearl of great price and he talked about the treasure and God buried the treasure. The treasure speaks of diamonds and gold and precious stones. That was Israel. The, 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 the ephrod, the breastplate that the high priest wore were filled with, with beautiful, beautiful precious stones. And Jesus said, I've hidden that treasure in the earth and now I've got this pearl of great price. The church is the pearl. It starts with one stone, Jesus Christ, and it's built and it's built and it's built and it's built. Layer after layer after layer after layer. And then how do you get a hold of that pearl? You open it up and you take it out of its shell. And that's what God is doing right now. Jesus said, I am building my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. God is going to continue to build us until one day he comes and says, that's enough and takes the pearl out. And then what is he going to do? He's going to unearth the treasure, Israel, and she's going to start and, and, and there's going to be one more week, seven years played out for his nation. And then Jesus Christ is going to come back as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. It's an absolute love story. It's the most amazing, amazing story. And so we find here those 62 weeks. Let me just, just give a side, a side thing here when we're talking about Israel not understanding the times and the seasons and, and not understanding, uh, as it were, Jesus Christ coming as the Lamb uh, and the line of the tribe of Judah. Let me um, just read a couple of scriptures here where Jesus himself quotes uh, in Luke 4, and it's not in your outline, but it's, and, and he's quoting Isaiah 61 that says that the spirit of the Lord is upon me. Remember he quoted that? He said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me. What has he anointed me to do at this first coming? To preach good tidings to the poor he has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, to open the prison doors to those that are bound, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Now, Jesus stopped right there because that was his first coming. What was that? The, to preach the, proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. That was the year of Jubilee. The year of Jubilee was everybody that was a slave could go back to freedom. That's what Jesus came to do, that we were all slaves of sin and death. And so he came to heal the brokenhearted, to preach liberty to those that were captive, recovery of sight to the blind, spiritually blind, we couldn't see. To preach the acceptable year of the Lord, which means we can go back to sonship as, as, as God our Father. But he stopped right there with the scripture which said, and the day of vengeance of our God. 
And so that day has to come. And so really the scripture in Isaiah, it says here to preach the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God. So one's the first coming, the day of vengeance of our God is his second coming. And Jesus didn't quote that part at that point in Luke. He left that out. He stopped right there, the acceptable year of Lord. That's what he'd come to do at the first coming. He's coming again, the day of vengeance of our God. And so God's got two time clocks, two time clocks. He's got the church clock, which is running for 69 years. There's one week that is left to play out. Um, in fact, let me just go back to the maths. If you want to have a look at your maths here, I'll do it. Yeah, I should have had a whiteboard. I wondered, I wondered if I should have the whiteboard. Okay, so you've got six sevens. Um, you've got 62 weeks and seven, so that's 434 years. Then add to that 49 years to rebuild Israel, rebuild the city. And so um, nine and four is what? It's 13. And then four and four is eight. 48. So then you've got 483 years. You've got seven years missing. One, one, week miss, one, one week missing, seven years. That's seven years. What is that? That's the seven years of tribulation. Isn't that amazing? Go home and do your maths. Is that okay, Stephen? Can you understand it? I'm not getting too complicated. Okay, he understands. So it must be okay for everybody else to understand. I didn't mean it like that. I didn't mean it like that. I meant that he wasn't giving me the eye as if it was too difficult. Uh, <laughs> that sounded very derogatory. It wasn't meant to. Praise the Lord. So isn't, that, isn't God's timing amazing? And so I'm not going to get into the rest of, um, I, I'm not going to get into the rest of, what should I say, the one week. In fact, let's just quickly turn to... to um, Daniel 9, 27. Why is Rome and Israel so important in this time clock? Because the clock stopped, God's clock. He's got two clocks, the clock for Israel and the clock for the church. Why is Rome so important? Because God stopped that clock on the day of Pentecost. When Jesus rose from the dead and the church age began. Remember we talked about dispensations? The can't, you can't have two dispensations running at the same time. The dispensation of the Lord stopped with one week left to play. And God started the, the, the church clock for two days. Two days, 2,000 years. That clock is about to stop. Jesus said the generation that sees, um, sees the rebirth of the nation of Israel, he says, watch the fig tree. He says, when you see the fig tree begin to, bur to, bur to um, bud, he says, that generation will not pass away until everything's fulfilled. That began in 1948. So the generation that was born in 1948, when Israel was taken from all the nations after thousands of years, 1,500, 1,700 years of being scattered through the nation, God brought, started to bring her back to her nation. That's never happened to any other nation. You look at all of the ancient empires that are no longer here and are no longer called by their name, and yet Israel was brought back. And so 1948, God, Jesus said, that generation will not pass until everything's fulfilled. And so we see that God stopped the clock when Israel was under rule from the Roman Empire. And so when God starts the clock again, he's not rewinding it. He's starting it exactly where it left off. And so right now, we're looking at Israel. Yes, we can now look at the nations and have a look and see what's happening in Europe and alliances that are happening within Europe. America is not going to be the strongest nation at the end times. And at the rapture of the church, probably more than half of America is going to disappear, is going to go up. And so we're having a look and we're seeing here. So I just want us, us, us to have a look and just see there's one week left to play. That there is actually going to be an alliance that is going to be so strong that Israel is not going to have to think that she needs her army like she has her army now. And from that 10 nations, there's going to be an agreement between Israel and these 10 nations 
and there's one, per, one, one man that's going to rise from within that nation, and he does not love the God of his fathers, which they, many say that he will actually be a Jew, he will actually be an Israelite, and he will rise up from within that ten-nation confederation, and he will make a peace treaty with Israel for seven years. And he will say, we are a strong nation. Look at us, 10 nations. You don't need to protect yourself. We are the ones. Yes, you're surrounded by nations that hate you. You're surrounded by people that hate you. But you're not going to have to fight for yourself. You make a covenant with us, and we will stand around you, and we will protect you. And then halfway through that seven years, three and a half years, this man will break that covenant, and he will set himself up in the temple as God. And will want to be worshipped. And then they will understand that this is not their Messiah. That this is the Antichrist. Antichrist. And there's all kinds of desolation, as we said, is going to go on during that time. And so uh, I want us to just have a quick look here at um, Nebuchadnezzar's dream. Because Nebuchadnezzar plays it out. Do you want to put up that statue on the, on the PowerPoint? Daniel had an amazing vision of, of four beasts, the lion and the bear and the, and, the, and the cheetah, and this creature that he couldn't name that was, that, that was like iron. Now look at Nebuchadnezzar's vision here. And I want to quickly read this to you, if, we can just, if you can give me a couple, a couple more minutes. Daniel chapter 2, Daniel, the king had this, this dream, Nebuchadnezzar. And it so frightened him that when he woke up, he, he knew he'd seen something, but he couldn't remember what it was. And so he called all of, his, all of his, his wise men and magicians and said to them, I want you to give me the interpretation of the dream. And they said, well, tell us what the dream was. He said, I can't tell you because I can't remember. And if you can't tell me the dream, and if you can't tell me the interpretation, you're all going to die. And they said, there's no king on the earth that would ask such a request. And he said, it's done, it's sealed, start killing them. And so they were starting to kill all the wise men in the nation. Uh, it's a bit of a silly thing to do as a king, isn't it, if you remove all your wise people? And they were coming to Daniel, and Daniel said, why is the king so, so angry? What's the problem? And then he explained it to him. He said, look, let me go before the king, say, stop, stop, just give me time. I'm going to seek the Lord. He said, I don't, know that, I don't know the answer. He says, but I know there's a God in heaven that reveals secrets. And so Daniel sought the Lord and God gave him the vision and God then gave him the interpretation. And Daniel went before King Nebuchadnezzar and said, this is your vision and this is the interpretation of it. And so verse 31 says, and he said, O king, you are watching and behold a great image. This great image whose splendor was excellent stood before you and its form was awesome. The image's head was fine gold, its chest and arms were silver, its belly and thighs bronze, and its legs of iron, and the feet partly of iron and partly of clay. And you watched while a stone was cut out without hands, Jesus Christ, which struck the image on the feet of iron and clay and broke it in pieces. Then the iron and clay and the bronze and the silver and the gold were crushed together uh, before uh, and became like chaff um, from the summer thresh threshing floor. And the wind carried it away so that there was no trace of them to be found. And the stone that was uh, struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. Now that is the run down on God's um, overview of the empires of this world. And so the head of gold is the Babylonian empire, and that was Nebuchadnezzar. And he said to him, you are this empire. You are the image of gold. And of course, he'd made himself this gold image and wanted everyone to bow down to it. And so we see here the, um, the Babylonian empire. Then next came the silver, which was the Medo-Persians, which was Darius and, and Cyrus. And then we had the belly and the thighs of brass. And you see how the metals actually degenerated from gold to silver to brass and then coming down into iron. And so these empires were not as great as the first empire. Now, we're not talking about empires before that, the Syrians and the Egypt, uh, Egyptians. This was from King Babylon um, onwards. And so we find here that the, the, um, the brass that you see there was God prophesying about Alexander the Great, the Grecian Empire that would come. And he would take over. And, and Alexander the Great, he was a genius of a man. Within 12 years, he had decimated all of the other empires and had actually taken the whole of, of the kingdoms. And he understood that if he wanted to have alliances and have these nations come together, that he, they all needed to speak one language. 
And so what he did was he, he created a language himself, and it was called Koine Greek. It wasn't like the flowery Greek that they had, that they spoke. This was a Greek language that was for the common people, and he taught it to all of his armies, and then the nations that he went into, he taught them this language. And so by the time Jesus Christ came, most of the nations were, able to, were bilingual. They could speak their mother tongue, and they could also speak Koine Greek, which was amazing because God used Alexander the Great to actually already create the path for the gospel to go out and to be preached throughout all the, 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 the then known world at the time. Absolutely amazing. Have a look and read your history. Sadly, he died as an unbeliever, even though God used him for that. Um, and, and so that, yeah, so that was setting it up for the next kingdom that would come, which would be the Roman Empire. And that Roman Empire was, up, was, was, was strong. It was actually the longest empire out of all of these others, that, the length of the leg. You can see where God was saying that they ruled for a longer period than any, any of the other empires. And then you see down at the bottom that the empire broke up into um, to iron and clay. And so the Roman Empire was probably finished about 130 AD after Jesus Christ. From the time that Jesus Christ died, they decimated um, the uh, nation of Jerusalem. It started to go into decline until it was no more. And then for the last 2,000 year period, there has not been no world empire, but there has been a kingdom that has been being built, which has been the church. And when the church is taken out, this other kingdom, the Roman Empire, will set in place again. But at this time, it's not going to be the same as it was. It's going to have a weakness there. There's going to be 10 nations around the European area. And it speaks of them being strong and being weak. Because you see, you can't mix iron and clay. It doesn't mix. And so you're going to find it's actually got a kind of... It's, you can see the, the EEC right now, you know, with, with German and all of these nations that are all aligning themselves. You know, they've now got one monetary system. Um, they are, have been 12 nations, they've gone back to 11. When, when it comes to the time of the end, when the church comes out, there will be 10 nations, um, um, and uh, one will rise up, and you'll have a look at that in, in Daniel, where you, where you see the goats, the, the visions of the goats, all these kinds of things that have an amazing meaning um, to it. But let me just finish here, shall I? because we're, we're nearly closing. Let's have a look and see what I can have a look at. So Daniel, Daniel said here, in fact, which, which is what I like, it says here, the legs were of iron and clay, and you watched while a stone was cut out without hands, which struck the image on its feet, and the iron and the clay were broken in pieces. Who's that? The rock, Jesus Christ, is going to come. So at the time of this alliance, when everything's going to look like it's lost for Israel, then the stone is going to come, Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the King of kings and Lord of lords, and he's going to come as this reigning prince and knock that kingdom, but not only knock that kingdom, he's going to decimate every other kingdom until it gets blown away, until there is no more evidence of it on the earth. Isn't that an amazing story? Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. And so let me just read this last part here. That the stone that was cut out without hands was the virgin birth of Jesus Christ. No man. Supernatural. And then we, if we go, and if you go and have a look at, at, at Revelations chapter 9, it talks about the ancient of days coming. Revelations 20 talks about them. And I'll just finish with this just as, as we close. Revelations 19 11. And then I saw in heaven, the heavens opened. And behold, a white horse. And he who sat on him was faithful and true. And in righteousness, the worship team, if you want to come on up, judges and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head was many crowns. He had a name written on it that no one knew except himself. And he was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, which is him giving his blood for us. And his name was called the Word of God. And that's what his name was before he became Jesus Christ. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. The same was in the beginning. Everything was made by him, and, and, and without him nothing was made that was made. In him was, praise the Lord, in fact, I'll carry on. It says here, and the armies of heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he would strike the nations, and he himself will rule them 
with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath of God, and he has on his robe and on his thigh the name King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Isn't that an amazing story? Isn't that an amazing story of the goodness of our God? So where are we at right now as the church? Well, where are we at for us? We're on fire for God. God is looking to us to do our part on the earth right now, to be that light, to be the salt of the earth, to be the light of the world, to do what we need to do in our generation. Because there's coming a time when that clock is going to stop. We're going into the tribulation. And as I said to you before, um, the door of salvation hasn't closed. But you don't want to go through the tribulation. Yes, you can be saved during the tribulation. Like we said, 144,000 Israelites will be sealed supernaturally and will go about the earth preaching the gospel. Satan and, and the kingdoms of this earth will not be able to kill those men at that time. You're going to have the two prophets, Moses and Elijah, who will come back into the earth. They never died. They were raptured out of here. And they will come back to the earth and they will be preaching the gospel of the kingdom. Not the gospel that we preach. It's the gospel of the coming king. And they'll be hated and Antichrist will hate them. The, 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 the beast will hate them. The prophet, the false prophet. And they will then, after three and a half years, they will kill them. Those men will lie in the streets for three and a half days. The whole world will see them dead and will have a party and will celebrate because these people that had annoyed them and preached righteousness will now be dead. And then the grace of God hits those boys and they come up and they rise up from the dead into heaven before all of the earth to see. It's the grace of God, as I said to you the last time, that God is showing the earth, yes, the dead can rise. Yes, there is such a thing as a rapture. Now turn and be saved. And just before the close, before the King of Kings comes, there's angels flying through the skies. Read it in the book of Revelations, saying salvation belongs to the Lord. Turn, turn, because when his feet touch the Mount of Olives and the mountain splits, that's it's all over. You can't get saved anymore. Eternally damned. And so this is why we need to be about the Father's business as the church, being a light and declaring salvation to our families, our loved ones, at the people in, in the workplace. That's what we're called to do. And when we arrive in heaven at the reward seat of Christ, he's going to reward you. There's crowns for being about the Father's business, for forsaking everything else and following him. Praise the Lord. And so this is our time to do that. And like I said to you the last time, God is giving us this message now so we can get our lives right. So we can put away every weight, every sin, everything that would try to hold us down, to get rid of the the, the wood, the hay, the stubble, the stuff that really is not that important in the light of eternity. And to start seeking Him while He may be found. Thank you, Father. Father God, we just want to thank you for this amazing message. We thank you, Lord, that as your word has gone into our heart, we're saying yes to it. We're saying, yes, Lord God, like Daniel said, yes. We're saying, yes, like, Lord, all of the champions that have gone before us have said, yes, to serve you in this time, in this hour that we live in. Father, we declare salvation right now over our nation. Father God, we even say, Father, like Daniel, Father, forgive our nation, forgive us for sinning against you and walking away from the God of our fathers. And Lord, we cry out to you to come visit our nation again. Lord God, we thank you. We thank you that we declare, Lord God, salvation. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, if you're not in a place where you know you should be, then I really encourage you, use this as a time. Just two, two or three minutes. Yes, we've got lunch waiting out there. But hey, our heart is more important. God, God. If you're feeling right now that you're in captivity for some reason, there's something not going right with your family or your life, then perhaps the answer may be to turn and look to him and just invite him to come on afresh and be in the place of his, 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 that is due to him, which is on the throne of our heart. There is no echo. Hallelujah. Father God, I'm not quite sure what you want to do, but I know you're here and you're doing a work in our lives. 
And so, Father, I want to thank you for dedication and consecration in our, in, in, in our church, in our people, in your people who are called by your name. Father God, humbling ourselves and praying before you, seeking your face, turning from our own ways. I thank you, Lord. Immediately you hear from heaven. Immediately you hear those words in heaven. And you bring healing and restoration and favor. Lord, I know this is not a salvation issue because we're already saved by grace through faith and what Jesus has done. But Lord God, there's works that we need to present to you. Gold, silver, precious stones. Works, Father God, of worship before you, Father. Works, Lord God, that we stand before your throne. And hear you say, well done, my good and faithful servant. And so, Father God, I thank you, Lord, as we're moving into the end of this year and moving into a new year. Father God, I just declare over this house, Lord God, that we're in agreement, that we're in unity, that we're on fire for you, Father God. We're on fire for you. We're laying aside everything else and being on fire for you. The glorious church without spot or wrinkle. <laughs> 